Okay, so I want to talk about designing with lenses. Uh, if you know a little bit about my past work, I worked on the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. So I like mental frameworks. Um, I like ways to uh, take design problems and sort of <laughs> summarize them in a simpler way. So that's why I worked on the Pattern Library and enjoy that kind of work. So recently I was playing a, a game called Pandemic. And a Pandemic is a cooperative game in which there's four uh, viruses that have broken out in the world. Hmm. Nice, relaxing Sunday afternoon game. <laughs> the world's in trouble. Uh, but this is a really favorite game of my family because it's a cooperative game in that uh, we all work together. We're not competing against each other because we're trying to save the world. Most of the time we don't. But we still have a lot of fun because we learn how to work together. We each have different roles and responsibilities. You know, maybe I can fly people places and maybe I can build uh, uh, you know, CDC centers around the world and help stamp out the viruses. But um, this game is actually built by a friend of mine who worked on the pattern library with me, uh, Matt Laycock. And Matt's a really brilliant interaction designer. He's also a very successful game designer, too. And we were having lunch talking about this because one of my fascinations has been learning from other fields of study. You know, looking at things like magic or furniture design or those sort of things and, and extracting principles and applying them back to the field of design. And a lot of times, specifically in web design, which is what I'm focused on most of these days, uh, they apply it to other areas. So the way the game works is basically these yellow cubes, blue cubes, red cubes look innocent, but they're actually viruses. And what can happen is, as you go through the cards, uh, you can have infections break out, and you get these chain reactions, and uh, it sort of gets out of hand. You can see that outbreaks area on the, on the left-hand side. If that little indicator keeps moving, it's all the way to the end, game over. You know, if you uh, can't cure all the diseases before you run out of cards, game over, you know, those sort of things. So, uh, but you work together in this. And so I was having lunch with Matt, and I was talking about, and I had a really crappy name for this. It was like Lessons from the meta, meta Craft. You know, it's kind of the craft, uh, the meta craft. And so this is a horrible name. So yeah, you're right, it's a really horrible name. And so what you want to think about, you know, is he was doing, thinking about his interaction design and applying it to board game design and back and forth. Um, he stumbled across a great book, and this book is um, called The Art of Game Design. I don't know if you've seen this book or not. It's a really good book by Jesse Schell. I'd recommend following, finding his videos and listening to them also. But uh, what Jesse did in this book was he cataloged 100 design lenses. And these design lenses give you a, a perspective to look at your game, in this case, designing games. And as I got the book and the, uh, the deck of cards, I realized that this concept of design, design lenses was really ripe to apply to you know, web design. So what I want to do today is kind of talk through that, just give you a little bit of mental framework around that, show you where I'm at in my thinking about it, uh, give you about four examples uh, in this. So here's what the deck of cards look like. Uh, an example is the lens of simplicity and complexity. And we'll break this one down in just a minute to understand it. But what a design lens allows you to do is to, to take the user experience, what you're building, designing, and gives you uh, a, a, just a kind of a narrow way to, to, to just take a look at it for a moment with a set of uh, questions that kind of focus your attention, which I think is really powerful. Um, and usually it comes from some other field of study is uh, the way it's framed. Um, so this is one of Jesse's cards uh, from the Design Lens uh, card deck. And you can see it's broken out. If you're familiar with the patterns work, and you know, one of the first things we did with the pattern library was to find what a pattern looked like. You know, it had a title because you needed some way to remember it. You had some kind of sensitizing example. You had, uh, you know, some kind of canonical solution. You had additional things to go with it. And real similar, a Design Lens, you know, has some kind of a, a figure that just is like a tickler to remember as you're flipping through the cards. Um, and then some synopsis. But key is these simple little focus questions. So it's, it's a really simple idea. Uh, not brain surgery, but I think very helpful. Uh, I've actually launched a site uh, about a month ago called designingwithlenses.com. There's an article on UX Booth about this. And I have a Twitter feed on UX Lenses um, that, of course, as soon as I launched it, I started a new job. And I've done absolutely nothing with it, but I promise you I will continue to work on it. I have a few other people working with me on it, so they'll probably contribute a lot more. Um, so I want to talk about just four lenses today. 
uh, and, and kind of deal in, drill into these. The first one's the simplicity complexity rule. And this is the one from Jesse's book that I've applied back. So there's a few basic questions you can ask yourself when you're thinking about this balance of simplicity and complexity. You know, if you're going to take the game of tic-tac-toe, and it's simple, right? But if you try to play it all weekend long, it would get pretty boring, right? Because there's no, there's no emerging complexity to the game. The rules are really, really simple. So chess, though, you know, has some simple kind of rules around the, the, the play pieces that aren't too hard to understand. But there's a lot of emerging complexity. So this balance of simplicity and complexity is really important, both in games and also in design. And so it's one of the questions we can ask ourselves. And Shaker Furniture, which if you're familiar with Shaker Furniture, you know, it looks at these simple chairs like this and other, other furniture design. One of the, the comments that uh, was written about it is they're simply made with an unhurried hand, chosen with care. You can lift the chair with a finger. It's agreeable for sitting. And that's a real balance, you know. Uh, and I think they're just beautifully elegant, but they're very functional. Um, and so the chair is easy to, to work with and easy to sit with. Sit in. One of their mantras was, do not make what is not useful. And so we're thinking about simplicity and complexity, asking ourselves as we look at our design, this lens can help us focus and think about, you know, are we putting too much in the interface or are we putting too little in the interface? Uh, pandemic, let's look at it just for a minute. One of the things that Matt had to struggle with when he designed the game was this balance of simplicity and complexity. At first, he had kind of a complicated way to uh, spread disease in the game. And you would take and you'd quarantine with cubes and you'd move, move and cure the cubes. And in, in the turn, you'd draw four points and cards counted for two and cubes counted for one. Kind of a complex system to learn. And after doing a lot of usability testing with it, uh, what it came back to was just to say, you know what? These eight different actions, one point, you get one point for each one and you get uh, four points in a turn and you draw two cards. And it really simplified the gameplay. You know, you want to put too much complexity in because you want all these little nuances, and really you don't need the nuances because a lot of the nuances came into the actual interaction of people playing the game and not so much with the game itself. So you have to ask yourself, is, is, am I making the interface intrinsically complex? And then you have to make it as simple as possible, but no simple because um, what, what he then tried to do because he learned that lesson was, well, let's take and create a single deck that does all of this on the left-hand side. And that uh, would be very simple, right? But it turned out to be not, didn't add anything to the game because it added a lot of complexity. And by separating the two cards out, it was really clear when you were dealing with infections versus normal gameplay. Real simple idea. But by separating the two out, uh, you end up with this right balance between simplicity and complexity. Uh, BMW had this design a few years back, probably about 2002, uh, with the BMW iDrive. And the idea was to have a single knob to control everything inside the car because they didn't want you to be distracted with pushing buttons on the radio. So instead, what you have to do is you have to fiddle with this knob, and it actually has an on screen display. You know, and what you end up doing is uh, uh, you have to ask yourself, OK, this is simple, right? It's one knob. But in the context, it's horrible, right? So simplicity does have a context. You can get really, really simple, but if the context is such that, in this case, you're trying to drive and maneuver and watch the screen, and you've got a single button. And yes, there, there, you begin to learn a few basic things that you can do, but that's all you end up doing. Because there's like 700 commands uh, that are hidden under one single knob. So another rev of it, they ended up having seven buttons and a knob, and now six programmable buttons on the actual uh, dash itself. Uh, kind of a nod to compromise, but you still have to sort of like navigate through the screen as you're doing it. So from a contextual perspective, uh, simplicity and complexity is a really hard one when you have this kind of context. And a lot of people will point to, you know, Google and they'll say, well, this is simplicity, right? Well, it's search. That's your context. It's really simple. But if you look at other Google products like Google Docs, there's more complexity, right? So. You can't just have a simple-minded idea of some simplicity and complexity. There's actually a balance, and you have to work and, and struggle to bring those two together. Uh, at Netflix, uh, previously where I worked, uh, we were trying to, to, to create a very simple way for users to rate and get another recommendation really quick. 
So in this case here, what's happening uh, is, I guess the movie's not showing for some reason, but if you click on the, uh, the stars, uh, say on this last movie, what would happen is another one would come in. And this worked really, really well. In fact, it worked too well. What happened was um, all the new users that were coming in were rating and rating and rating. And they never had time to add any movies to the queue, right? So our taste input went way up, but retention dropped. And queue ads, which is a measure of adding to the queue, is a measure of consumption, dropped. Not good. So what we had to do is we took this, this simple idea that really did work, but was in the wrong context, and we moved it to a different context. We put it in a different part of the site that was dedicated to rating movies, which is already a place we use. But the, the actual winning cell ended up not having the ad button even, just focused on, on rating. And the, the beauty of this, what happened was uh, taste input star ratings went up, which feeds our, fed the recommendation engine. But also, uh, consumption went up and retention went up, which is pretty amazing by putting it in the right context. So simplicity has to be understood in the right context. Uh, this next one is flow. And if you remember the book Flow, you'll understand that you get some mental focused energy. So you want to ask yourself, in this lens, in my interface, uh, am I keeping the user in the flow? Am, or am I interrupting the user needlessly? And uh, at the Exploratorium, there's an exhibit, and I'll show you an example of this. I want you to just take a moment. Those of you in the workshop here today, you've seen this example, so you're not allowed to cheat. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's see if you can spot the differences. OK, other than the ones that were in the workshop, who can see the change that's happening? OK, I don't see a hand. All right, one, two, OK, a couple. OK, a few back there. All right, excellent. So what's really happening is, now I'll do it without the refresh. Mm -hmm. You see it now? <laughs> yeah. This is called change blindness. And I'll go back and show you that I'm, I'm not lying. And let you see that again. See? You see it now, right? <laughs> and this is a phenomenon that happens. And what's happening is we're breaking the flow. We're breaking the visual continuity, right? And so just one of the ways that you can break flow is by, by even introducing a page refresh. Uh, and that's so easy to do, right, in the web world with request response. So you have to think about are the natural transitions in this whole idea of flow. Uh, here's an older example from Yahoo Photos I like to show, I think, because of the dancing hamsters that will come up in just a minute. But you notice we're dragging into here. We get an idiot box that pops up. We get dancing hamsters. And then we get another idiot box that pops up. And what's happening is because there's no subtle uh, uh, information showing, uh, uh, because we're not, we're not actually showing when, they, when you drag over the album, something lights up. And when something goes in the album that something happened, the design team that was, was kind of like a rented design project with what was going on with Yahoo Photos, they had a new designer every few weeks. Okay? So as a new designer came in, they added Band-Aids. And the Band-Aid was basically you know, to throw up more dialogue boxes. And these uh, are, are what I call idiot boxes, because they just interrupt the proceedings, as Alan Cooper said, with idiocy. And they break the flow, and they, they serve no purpose. And the dancing hamsters also are really cute. I don't know if they serve any purpose. Uh, so recently I was judging the, some sites uh, for, uh, uh, well, actually, I probably shouldn't talk too much about it, because it's an upcoming, they're going to announce it. So I won't say what I actually arrived at. But this is AIGA's design archives. And what they've done is redesigned it, and now you can see a whole gallery of designs, say they're books or prints or whatever. And they've given a nice way to kind of get a quick glance at all of these, right? When I went through this interface, I kept being troubled. And what was troubling to me was the tools themselves, the things I used to manipulate and go through and browse, were primary to me. That was what I was focused more on than I was on the actual design elements themselves there, you know, the, the, the gallery archives. And I felt like I was always looking through a peephole. Because you notice when I had the little hover pop up, you know, I'd look at one and it'd pop up, and look at another and pop up. And even in this view, instead of just putting the letters of, of John Mar uh, Mar Marin down below, they have it in a little hover pop up, right? And so there's no way I can ever even get to a flow in this, uh, in this, in this whole experience because I'm always futzing with the tools, right? 
I'm always having to bring up a hover pop-up or do the design, you know, the, little, uh, the little different views of gallery and everything else. So it ends up, you know, I end up looking at tools and, and having my efforts being dampened instead of amplified. And if we're going to create a flow, we have to amplify instead of dampen. So, you know, this is, uh, I've got to slow down just to kind of show you what's happening in, I, in the iPad for Mel, right? And I'm actually selecting some elements. They're being thrown into a stack. And in a minute, they'll be deleted. You'll see the stack fly away, right? And this has created, uh, this has created a flow in, in the whole process of deleting. I'm not having to go from page to page or whatever. I get a real constant, and it feels very physical, and the flow feels very good. And so this uh, third lens is around the supporting actor. And so uh, one of the most common things I see when I'm critiquing uh, web pages and websites is things that should be secondary become primary. Things that should be a reinforcement uh, become the main thing, the main stage. Uh, if you saw in Glorious Bastards, I really love Christopher Walt's performance uh, in this, and he won uh, Best Supporting Actor in, uh, in 2009 for this. But a supporting actor enhances the plot, right? And doesn't upstage the main actor. Uh, Thelma Ritter was also a great actress, uh, supporting actress. And she was nominated six times uh, for Best Supporting Actress, but never won, actually. If you've seen Rear Window, one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, she plays uh, Stella in Rear Window. And just a lovely actress. But we have to ask ourselves these questions. Do they enhance the overall plot or go? What would, they, what would the experience be like without them? You know, removing these uh, elements in our interface or effects is really a powerful way to understand what contribution they're really making. So tax time in the States is April the 15th, OK? It's always a dreaded time for me, because I now live in California, and I get double tax. I used to live in Texas, and there were no state taxes. So now I have to pay both for California and the federal government. So I was fiddling with what's going to happen next year when I buy a house and mortgage interest, and uh, I'm going to make a change. My current tax, this is not my real taxes, thankfully, but close, uh, 10,533. Now watch what happens when I change this. Watch the number. Went to 98,000 before it dropped to 9,000. Watch it again. Slow motion. 10,533. It's like Biggest Loser. If you're in the States, you know what Biggest Loser is. You may not know it in Europe. But you get this, this crazy scale effect of like, and I had heart attacks all night long. When I was doing my taxes, every time I changed something, it would go up and it would go down. And I never knew if I did, did it actually go down or not because I lost the context of what happened, right? And instead of being a supporting actor, some kind of a, you know, effect like maybe it fades or there's some kind of a, little, a highlight behind it and I know it changed. Maybe I know it went up or down. It gave me some indication. Instead of getting this ridiculous, needless fanfare kind of anti-pattern where it's going up and down, up and down. And if you watch the show Biggest Loser, you know, Kathy gets on the scale. You have no idea if she lost weight or not. It goes up for a little while. It goes down for a little while. And finally it lands and she lost two pounds, right? Hey, Kathy lost two pounds. So Occam said, what can be dealt with less is done in vain with more, which I really love that. And uh, you have to ask yourself, does it enhance the overall plot and go, Bear Paint uh, has a whole bunch of what should be supporting actors that have become main actors. Uh, the whole interface, you cannot do anything without having animated menus, animated uh, dialogues popping up, animated slide out effects. This is a disease that especially lives in the world of flex. Okay? <laughs> Combo boxes are all animated and menus are all animated. And it's, can we just never have another animated menu? Can we, can we all just agree on that? It's <laughs> Because these are supposed to be supporting actors, not the main stage. They're just tools, right? And they make the interface feel sluggish, which is not good. <coughs> our effects, our transitions, right? Not just visual, but any kind of transitions we're doing, make them as small as possible. It's kind of the old contrast trick, that you basically remove everything, you turn the knobs back up, the contrast knobs back up, to see what effect, what communication this gives, or what engagement it gives, you know, what effect it gives, and decide whether to use it or not. So uh, I think this was the time with Peter, because Peter had slides like this, too, where we're running down a tunnel or something. It's pretty close. This is the first time. He was, no, actually, I didn't know he was going to do that. But there's a tie. So, uh, and and when, I, when I look at some different interface, like this is Roost, and they're going from house shot to house shot, right? Picture to picture. 
There's this long crossfade. Why? Because some engineer thought it was cool? Did it, does it really help you, you know, does it take over and become the thing that you see? They changed it, and now it's a slide effect. Do I need that? I mean, if I'm just trying to look at house pictures, do I, just, do I even need a, a transition at all, right? Um, so they had a better interface before these two, okay? And it was basically it opened up. The crossfade's still a little bit too slow for me, my own taste. And I, I talked to the workshop yesterday, I talked about the cheesiness rule, okay? Whatever you do today with a special effect, a year from now will look cheesy, okay? Because we'll get tired of it. So a good rule of thumb is to always take whatever effect you're doing and just cut it in half. If you're, you know, got a quarter second, make it an eighth of a second. And for good measure, maybe, maybe you cut it in half again. And you'll usually be safe and, a, and you'll avoid the cheesiness rule, you know, a year from now, which I've seen happen over and over again. You have to ask, are there more alternate subtle effects? In this case, bringing it in context and, and keeping it in line where I can see everything was a, a nice way to and the last one uh, is around interesting moments. This lens uh, puts a microscope on the interactions in your interface. And, uh, and I draw my inspiration from magic and comics in this one. And there's a, a great book, a set of books, actually a trilogy, that actually Bruce Tocnazzini mentioned in an article back in the early 90s on magic and, and user experience uh, by a guy named Fitzky. And I actually found all three pretty cheap on eBay the other day, and they're out of print, so I was pretty excited about that, and I started to read them. Magic by Misdirection, The Art of so Showmanship, and they're really good about uh, understanding how magic works, you know, from a performance perspective. And a lot of what we do, and user experience, is really an illusion. Uh, and magic, he says, is both in the details and in the performance. And that's so true, you know, our user experiences we try to create. And for this interesting moments, I can draw my inspiration from a lot of different areas, right? You can go back to, to stained glass and frescoes, right? And they tell a story frame by frame by frame. And we try to do that with our, with our user experience. We try to pull all together and, and create you know, some sort of a, an effect like that. Uh, Scott McCloud's great book, Understanding Comics, which talks about the language of you know, animation and timing and panels and, you know, and putting things together to, to tell a story. Uh, this great book, The Illusion of Life, uh, which is by three of the, of the nine uh, Disney masters of, of animation. They talk about 12 principles of, of animation there. And they really, it really gets you focused on how important the details and the performance is. And the same with uh, Fitzky's book. And I love this phrase here, the delicacy of the illusion. And so, you know, we're in essence trying to create a user illusion with the user experience. And it's very delicate, and we have to treat it that way. And so we have to think very carefully about interesting moments. You know, this is an illusion where I'm gonna, where he's gonna make this lady disappear, and when he pulls the board, the, the box away, she's gone. Right? And it's it's tied up in those details in the performance. Any bit of light that shines to show the real secret behind this, or any misstep of handling the the, the, the box he's gonna throw the lady, is gonna reveal the illusion. And uh, so it's very, very important to get those details right. Again, I show the same thing with, uh, with this interface I showed on the iPad just a minute ago. Uh, this is really an illusion. It's, you know, there's not really a stack of mail there. Right? But we, we're creating more and more physical interfaces that feel more and more real. And so we're creating more and more of an illusion. And this, this importance of performance and detail becomes more and more important. Uh, Dave Smith back at Xerox, when we were talking about the Xerox Star, which is the predecessor to Lisa and the, and the Macintosh, said the interface, called it the user illusion. So when you look at this delicacy of illusion, you know there's actually a place where the lady can slide through and she gets through the trap door, right? But if that was not covered correctly, like I said, then it would expose the trick. So this is also an illusion, just something as simple as drag and drop, right? I mean, you're not really dragging these modules around, this is all the software. Right? And so it looks pretty simple, but it's really, there's a lot of details. These are all the events that are involved just in a drag and drop, right? Uh, at least 16. And then there's uh, all these actors, these elements of the page that get involved. Uh, when you put them all together, you end up with 96 permutations, 96 interesting moments to deal with just for a drag and drop. You can take any interaction and kind of create a, a matrix like this. Uh, run your events on one side and your actors down the other side, a little bit like the flash timeline.
on separate. And you can plot those in. For example, in here with Gmail, with, uh, with the iGoogle, with the drag and drop, you can see changing the hand to a pointer or changing to a normal style. What's really intriguing is there are holes up here. Now, were those thoughtful holes? Were those times when the designer actually decided not to do something, or was it just something they didn't think about? When you put it in a, in a form like this, I think it really helps to think about what you're deciding to engage in and where you're deciding to rest in, which is really, really important, and, and, and it makes, you know, makes an illusion happen or not. Uh, for example, changing the pointer to a normal style is probably not very helpful if you've had a little grabby, right, that you know you're actually moving this. And so considering the details, almost with a microscopic view is what this lens is about. <coughs> Taking a very detailed uh, look. You know, with this, if I hover long enough on Google Maps, over the little street view guy, it'll finally come up and say, hey, drag me to a street. Right? Somebody consider the moment of hovering long enough after three seconds or so to do that. That's, that's a nuanced interface, you know. And it's, a, it's always a delight for me to find those kind of experiences where it helps me understand something. Even the dragging it over and getting the, the blue lines or, or the street views available and a little bit of a 3D representation how it's going to draw are all really powerful things. And they add up to, you know, enforcing the story that there's actually the street view guy you can put on the map and he actually looks around and you can see through him and all that. So it's an illusion, but it's carried out by these little interesting moments. This one does not. This is Barnes & Noble, and they, these booksellers really have some really crappy interfaces. This is a, a, not a carousel, but a conveyor belt. And it also has this crazy effect of hover and cover as you move back and forth, and also does a lot of in and out blinking. And if you actually try to change this direction, all you do is change the direction. You can't change the speed, right? So in this case, the whole illusion is broken. I don't know what illusion they're actually trying to create. I mean, it's supposed to be like a, you know, like a carousel, right? A, a, you know, a slider of, of content. But instead, I have to watch this slow motion. It's like watching that Lucy episode, you know, when she's doing the pies, except in slow motion, right? Very, very good. Out of there. So a design lens allows you to view the user experience from the perspective of a single design principle. Patterns are about taking a problem, setting it in, uh, say, setting a solution in context of a problem and giving some kind of prescriptive solution. All this really is is just another way to talk about design principles. So it's not really anything new, but I think sometimes when you take a different perspective on something, it helps us think about it. So it's a mental framework that I think can be powerful. You could collect these in your organization. You could take your design principles, you could call them a design lens, give a few focusing questions to kind of set your right frame of mind, Put those on just some little index cards, and you can use them in your organization. Kind of those tenets that Peter talked about, right? Putting those down uh, is really powerful. Um, and by asking these focusing questions, it brings a single principle into, into focus. And you can think of this as a library of design principles. Again, you can find out more there. I have a lot of resources of books that are available out there too that you might want to check out. Uh, and this is really hard to see for some reason. But I, this was my first cut at it, it was just on index cards. Um, and I also came up with role cards, you know, with the, so you have like the role of scientist for A-B testing, right? The role of my mother, who knows nothing about technology. So you take on a role and you ask these, these lenses from those perspectives. The role of a wizard, where you get to pronounce magic and wield the, uh, the magic principle and say, what if we had no technology and this was just, we could just do this and get rid of all those boundaries, those, those barriers. Uh, the role of the slasher, which is, yield, which is wielding Occam's razor uh, and being ruthless about simplicity and picking up all the lenses around simplicity and uh, attacking the design with, uh, with abandon. So this is, uh, you can uh, pick up this presentation there and uh, follow, I actually have a UX lenses tw a Twitter feed uh, you can follow and I think we have two minutes uh, for any questions. <laughs> And I have a book signing as well as Peter does too, uh, up at the O'Reilly booth upstairs. So, does anybody have a quick question? Yes, back here. This is, uh, this, this is such a straight, okay, so everybody has a plan in the audience, this is talking about magic. This is my co-author standing up, I, you know, in full disclosure, before she does something, yeah, go ahead. 
remember I was supposed to remind you to mention our new O'Reilly video? That's right, yes. I'm so <laughs> bad about promoting anything. Uh, yes, she's such a, see, that's great. Isn't it? So, uh, oh my, looks good, works well, looks good, works well .com blog. I'll, I'll post this, but, but Teresa and I went to a wonderful studio in Sonoma, filmed an a, a, a HD with a full camera crew with O'Reilly doing this, uh, about four hours of material on designing uh, uh, for interesting moments, uh, screen patterns, UI controls, and, uh, but it does have a cost. It's about 100 bucks, but you can share it with the whole team and stuff like that. So uh, I, I keep forgetting to mention that. If you're interested, if you couldn't go to the workshop yesterday, for example, you might want to pick that up. But look in the next day or so for looks good, workswell.com. I'll actually put something up that I'm so recalcitrant, not doing, I'm supposed to have done it like a month ago. So, that was a really lame question, but <laughs> thanks, Teresa. I think we are at 10:30, and uh, I want to respect that, uh, unless somebody just has a burning question. All right, great. Thanks, Bruce.